Morning class. Today we've been going over chapter 39, Incident Management. EMS operations, knowledge of operational roles and responsibilities to ensure patient, public, and personal safety. Incident management, establish and work within the incident management system. Multiple casualty incidents, triage principles, resource management, triage, performing, retriage, destination decisions, post-traumatic and cumulative uh, stress. Hazardous materials awareness, risk and responsibilities of operating in cold zone at a hazardous material or other special incident. Introduction, disasters and mass casualty incidents or MCIs can be overwhelming. Three or more patients, lack of resources. Incident command system or ICS makes it possible to do the greatest good for the greater no greatest number. National Incident Management System, or NIMS, promotes efficient coordination of emergency incidents at the regional, state, and national levels. The National Incident Management System is implemented in 2004, provides a framework, enables federal, state, and local governments to work together, as well as private sector and non-governmental organizations. Organizational structure must be flexible enough to be rapidly adaptable to provide standardization and terminology, resource classification, personnel training, and certification. Major NIMS components, preparedness, communications, and information management, resource management, command and management, ongoing management, and maintenance. Incident command system, sometimes referred to as the incident management system, the purpose of the ICS is to ensure responder and public safety, achieve incident management goals, ensure the efficient use of resources. Controls duplication of effort and freelancing, limits the span of control, one supervisor for three to seven workers. Organizational levels include sections, branches, divisions, and groups. Roles and responsibility, uh, command, finance, logistics, operations, planning, and command staff. Um, so these first four are going to be your, your kind of, excuse me, finance through planning is going to be your uh, four branches in the, uh, the incident command system. Uh, you're going to have one uh, ICS or incident command staff chief or incident command system chief, excuse me. Command, incident commander is in charge of the overall incident, so you're gonna have one person involved. Um, it is important to know who the IC is, how to communicate with the IC, and where the command post is located. An IC may turn over command to someone with more experience in a critical area. So the first person who gets on scene who is of higher level of care is gonna be the incident commander on a, a multi-casualty incident. If someone comes along, say, um, say if you have two EMTs on scene, the most senior EMT is going to be the incident command commander at that point. If a ALS unit arrives, um, the paramedic is going to be the incident commander. Uh, if a fire captain arrives, fire captain's probably going to be the incident commander, and so on and so forth. Finance responsible for documenting all expenditures at an incident for reimbursement. Um, so any supplies used, um, you're going to go through the finance section. Logistics, responsible for communications, equipment, facilities, food, water, fuel, lightning, lighting, and medical equipment and supplies. So you're going to go to the logistics area uh, for any anything uh, you might need for the MCI. Operations at a very large or complex incident, responsible for managing the tactical operations usually handled by the IC. Supervises the people working at the scene, uh, planning, solves problems as they arise, develops an incident action plan. Command staff, the safety officer monitors the scene for conditions or operations that may present a hazard. The public information officer, PI, PIO, provides the media with clear and understandable information. So if anybody comes up to you on scene of an MCI, you direct them to the public information officer. You do not give um, anybody information about what may be going on. Uh, liaison officer relays information and concerns among command, the general staff, and other agencies. 
Communications and information management. Communication has historically been the weak point at most major incidents. It is recommended that communications be integrated. All agencies should be able to communicate quickly and effortlessly via radios. Communications allow for accountability and instant communication. So another good reason to, to implement the XES system at uh, multi-casualty incidents, especially with uh, different agencies from different counties, is we do not use radio codes in here. We use simple language. That way everyone can understand what's coming across the radio because certain agencies might use um, a different type of uh, language system to communicate versus the agency, uh, the county over, might use 10 calls to communicate um, and things would get lost in translation. So that's a good reason to have um, simple commands and not use uh, codes or different types of languages for MCIs. Mobilization deployment, check in with the incident commander when you arrive. So the first thing you do when you come on scene is you check in with your incident commander. Um, he's gonna let you know where to go, um, what resources or supervisor you need to go talk to. So report to your supervisor for initial briefing. He'll tell you kind of what's going on and where to go. Record, record keeping allows for tracking of time spent on the actual incident for reimbursement purposes. Accountability means keeping your supervisor advised of your location, actions, and completed task. Once the incident has been stabilized, the IC will determine which resources are needed and when to begin uh, demobilization. EMS response within the incident command system. Preparedness involves the decisions made and basic planning done before an incident occurs involves decisions and planning about the most likely natural disasters for your area. Your EMS agency should have written disaster plans that have that you are regularly trained to carry out. Scene size up, make an initial assessment and some preliminary decisions driven by three basic questions. What do I have? What do I need? And what do I need to do? Okay. Establish and command. Command should be established by most senior official. Uh, notification other responders should go out. Uh, necessary resources should be requested. Command must be established early. So know your local protocols, know your uh, different types of MCIs. Uh, in Monterey County, we have uh, three levels of MCIs, uh, level one, level two, and level three. And know how to notify for um, uh, MCI. Notify or know who to notify for an MCI. Communications, if possible, use face to face communications to limit radio traffic. If you communicate via radio, do not use 10 codes or signals. Uh, this is what we talked about early, earlier. Um, this way, everyone could understand who's listening to the radio. Equipment must be reliable, durable, and field tested. Be sure there are backups in place. Make sure there is extra batteries as well. The medical branch of incident command, medical incident command is also known as the medical or EMS branch of the ICS. Primary rules of triage, treatment, and transport of injured people. Triage supervisor in charge of counting and prioritizing patients ensures that every patient receives initial assessment of his or her condition. Do not begin treatment until all patients are triaged. So this person also is probably going to tell you which hospital to take that patient to. Because if you all go to the same trauma hospital, that hospital is going to be overloaded. Um, you can only take about um, two to three critical patients to Natividad. Uh, it depends on how many doctors are on that day. It depends on how many people they, they have on staff. Um, they might take you to a different hospital, depending on the severity of their injuries. So he's going to tell you where to go. Treatment supervisor locates and sets up the treatment area with a tier for each priority of patient, ensures that secondary triage is performed and that adequate patient care is given, assists with moving patients to the transportation area. Transportation supervisor coordinates the transportation distribution of patients to appropriate receiving hospital, documents and tracks the number of transport vehicles, patients transported, and the facility destination. Um, so he's going to know how many people are transported to each hospital. Um, so he's going to have maybe eight go to Natividad, maybe six go to Salinas Valley Memorial, maybe another uh, six going to Chomp. Um, and he's going to be aware of that. 
um, how many people have gone to each facility. Staging supervisor should be assigned when scene requires a multi-vehicle or multi-agency response. Emergency vehicles must have permission to enter the scene and only drive in the directed area. The staging area should be established away from the scene. Physicians on scene make difficult triage decision, provide secondary triage decisions in the treatment area, provide on-scene medical direction for EMTs, provide care in the treatment sector as appropriate. Rehabilitation supervisor, established in an area that provides protection from the elements and situation. Rehabilitation is where responders' needs for rest, fluids, food, and protection from elements are met. Monitors responders for signs of stress, um, especially in uh, critical MCIs. Uh, everyone handles it differently. You want to make sure that your partner is doing okay, uh, especially on long MCIs, especially in hot environments, cold environments. Uh, they might need a rest period. So always uh, look out for the safety of yourself and your partner. Extrication and special rescue determines the type of equipment and resources needed for the situation. Usually function under the EMS branch of the ICS. Morgue supervisor works with area medical examiners, coroners, disaster and mortuary assistance teams, and law enforcement agencies to coordinate the removal of bodies and body parts. The morgue area should be out of view of the living patients and other responders. Mass casualty incidents. A mass casualty incident involves three or more patients, places great demand on the EMS system, has the potential to produce multiple casualties. All systems have different protocols for when to declare an MCI and initiate the ICS. You and your team cannot treat and transport all injured patients at the same time. Never leave the scene with patients if there are still other patients who are sick and wounded. If there are multiple patients and not enough resources to handle them without abandoning victims, you should declare an MCI, request additional resources, initiate the ICS and triage procedures um, that are within your county protocol or within your agency. Triage. Triage means to sort patients based on the severity of their injuries. Assessment is brief and patient condition categories are basic. Primary triage is done in the field. Secondary triage is done as patients are brought to the treatment area. Four common categories give the, uh, the order of treatment and, and transport. Immediate red, delayed yellow, mi minor or minimal, green hold, expectant black, likely to die or dead. So those are gonna be your four um, triage tags. So every patient before you start treating, um, they're gonna get a triage tag. And you're gonna tag them red, yellow, green, or black. Triage patients early assist in tracking them and can help keep an accurate record of their condition. Tags should be waterproof, easily read, and color-coded. Start triage. Uh, simple triage and rapid treatment. First step is call out patients and direct them to an easily identifiable landmark. Injured persons are the walking wounded. Second step is directed toward non-walking patients. Assess the respiratory rate, hemodynamic status, and neurologic status. Jumpstart triage for pediatric patients. Intended for use in children younger than 8 years or appear less to weigh less than 100 pounds. Begin by identifying the walking wounded. Several different Differences within the respiratory status assessment compared with START. Assess the approximate rate of respirations, hemodynamic status, and neurologic status. Triage special con considerations. Patients who are hysterical and disrupted to rescue efforts may need to be handled as an immediate priority. A responder who becomes sick or injured during the rescue efforts should be handled as an immediate priority. So anytime a first responder on scene is injured or sick, um, that patient needs to be transported immediately or be taken off scene uh, because it's detrimental to the other first responders on scene. They may become distracted or worried about their, their coworker or friend. Identify patients as contaminated or decontaminated in hazmat incidents. Destination decisions. All patients triaged as immediate red or delayed yellow should be transported by ground or air ambulance. In large situations, a bus may transport the walking wounded. Immediate priority patients should be transported two at a time until all are transported from the site. 
Then patients in the delay category may transport two or three at a time. Finally, the slightly injured or transported expectant patients who are still alive would receive transport or receive treatment and transport last. Dead victims are handled and transported according to the SOP or standard op- standard operating uh, procedures for that area, for that county. Disaster management. A disaster is a widespread event, disrupts the functions and resources of the community, threatens lives and properties. Many disasters may not involve personal injuries, but many disasters, floods, fires, hurricanes, result in widespread injuries. Your role is to respond and request and report to the IC for assigned task. A casualty collection area may be established in a disaster with an overwhelming number of casualties coordinated through the ICS in the same way as all other branches and areas of operation. Introduction to hazardous materials. When you arrive at a possible hazmat incident, first step back and assess the situation. Rushing into unsafe scenes can be catastrophic. If overcome, you'll be able to, you will be unable to assist patients. Requiring emergency care yourself, you will further strain the system. Uh, so remember, uphill and upwind on any hazmat situation. According to Hazwopper, uh, first responders at the awareness level should have sufficient training or experience to de- demonstrate the following competencies and an understanding of what hazardous substances are and the risk associated with them. An understanding of the potential outcomes of an incident. The ability to recognize the presence of hazardous substances, the ability to identify the hazardous substances if possible, an understanding of the role of the first responder awareness individual, the ability to determine the need for additional resources and to notify the communication center. Recognizing a hazardous material. A hazardous material poses an unreasonable risk of damage or injury if it is not properly controlled during handling. Storage, manufacturing, processing, packing, use and disposal, and transportation. Take time to look at the whole scene. Um, so remember, this is part of your scene size up. Always look for clues on what may be going on. Um, look for any hazardous materials, placards. Identify critical visual indicators. Hazardous materials may be involved in any of the following situations. A truck or train crash in which a substance is leaking from a tank truck or tank car. A leak, fire, or other emergency at an industrial plant, refinery, or other complex. A leak or rupture of an underground natural gas pipe. Deterioration of underground fuel tanks and seepage of oil or gas, gasoline into the ground. Buildup of methane or other byproducts of waste decompos- decomposition in sewers. A motor vehicle crash resulting in a ruptured gas tank. So this looks like it might be a propane tank right here, caught fire. Um, remember what I've talked about, O2 tanks. Um, if you drop those things, if you hit the, the top or the head or the neck of the bottle, those things could go flying. Same thing with this. This thing could go flying and cause another uh, uh, accident. And then we have a fuel tanker and a bus. Okay, so we want to make sure there's nobody... Um, Nobody else is riding the bus besides the driver. And then we got fuel on the ground as well. Occupancy and location. A wide variety of chemicals are stored in locations such as warehouses, hospitals and laboratories, industrial complexes, residential garages, bowling alleys, home improvement and garden centers, restaurants. Senses. The senses that can be safely used are those of sight and sound. Using any of your senses that bring you in proximity to the chemical should be done with caution or avoided. Clues that are seen or heard from a distance may enable you to take precautionary steps. Containers. A container is any vessel or receptacle that holds a material. Often the container type, size, and material construction provide important clues about the nature of the substance inside. Two categories, bulk and non-bulk. Container volume. Bulk storage containers are found in buildings that rely on and need to store large quantities of a particular chemical or substance. These containers are often surrounded by a secondary containment system to help control an accidental release. Large volume horizontal tanks are also common. Totes of capacities ranging from 119 gallons to 703 gallons contain any type of chemical, 
including flammable liquids, corrosives, food grade liquids, or oxidizers. No secondary containment system. So here's some of your different types of containers as well. So intermodal tanks are both shipping and storage vessels, hold between 5,000 and 6,000 gallons, can be pressurized or non-pressurized. Non-bulk storage vessels hold commonly used commercial and industrial chemicals. Drums are easily recognizable barrel-like containers. Generally, the nature of the chemical dictates the construction of the drum. Bags are commonly used to store solids and powders, maybe construction of plastic paper, plastic line paper. Pesticide bags are must be labeled with specific information. Carboys transport and store corrosives and other types of chemicals. Glasses, plastic, or steel container that holds 5 to 15 gallons of product. Often places in a protective wood, foam, fiberglass, or steel box. So, uninsulated compressed gas cylinders are used to store substances such as nitrogen, argon, helium, and oxygen. Department of Transportation Marking System, or DOT, labels, placards, and other markings are used on buildings, packages, boxes, and containers. Marking systems indicate the presence of a hazardous material from a safe distance and provide clues about the substance. Placards are diamond-shaped indicators. I'm sure you guys have seen these before. I guarantee you guys have seen these before, but I haven't paid much attention. Uh, placed on four sides of transport vehicles. Labels are smaller versions of placards. Placed on four sides of individual boxes and smaller packages. So here, what do you think red means? Kind of shows you right here. It's going to be fire. Um, usually they'll have um, it in the four different uh, categories. They'll have like a triangle here, a triangle here, a triangle here, and a triangle here. And it'll tell you different types, yellow, white, red, and blue, and then it'll also give you a number. Um, I, I believe it goes up to four. Uh, four is the most um, volatile of the categories. Uh, one is the least volatile. So three is pretty flammable um, so if it catches fire other considerations the DOT system does not require that all chemical ship shipments be marked in most cases a package or cargo tank contain cargo tank must contain a certain amount of hazardous material before a placard is required some chemicals are so hazardous that shipping any amount requires the use of labels or placards the emergency response guidebook. Um, so the picture in here is probably going to be the orange book, a small handbook. Uh, it offers a certain amount of guidance for responders operating a hazmat incident, updated every three to four years, provides information on approximately 4,000 chemicals. Um, so it is a very good reference to have. I believe it is mandatory for all ambulances to carry uh, in some counties. Material safety data sheets, or MSDS, common source of information about a particular chemical, provides basic information about the chemical makeup of a substance, potential hazards it presents, appropriate first aid in the event of an exposure, other pertinent data for safe handling. So anytime you're transporting um, some type of chemical, uh, the, the tow truck driver or the driver of the vehicle is gonna have an MSDS, or material safety data sheet. It's going to um, tell you what the substance is, how much it's carrying, and a whole bunch of other information regarding um, the substance in that vehicle. Shipping papers required whenever materials are transported from one place to another. Includes names and addresses of the shipper and the receiver. Identify the material being shipped and specify the quantity and weight of each part of the shipment. Chemical Transportation Emergency Center, Chemtrack. Chemtrek is operated by the American Chemistry Council. It serves as an invaluable technical information resource for first responders of all disciplines who are called upon to respond to chemical incidents. Identification. Despite the availability of resources, identification may still be difficult. The presence of the following may help. Visible cloud or strange-looking smoke from the escaping substance. 
Leak or spill from a tank, container, truck, or railroad car. Unusual, strong, noxious, harsh odor in the area. If any signs suggest that a hazmat incident has occurred, stop at a safe distance and park upwind or uphill. Call for the hazmat team. Try to rapidly assess the situation and try to provide as much information as possible. Do not enter, re-enter the scene and do not leave the area until you have been cleared. Avoid all contact with the material. Um, entering and re-entering the scene, you might be uh, contaminated again uh, and you might need to be decontaminated. Hazmat scene operations, use the ambulance's public address system. Alert individuals near the scene and direct them to move. Establish control zones. Securing access helps ensure that no one will accidentally enter the contaminated area. So you should prepare to expand or contract the control zones if necessary. Hot zone, an area immediately surrounding the release, most contaminated area. All personnel must be decontaminated when they leave the hot zone. They're going to go into the warm zone, where personnel and equipment transition into and out of the hot zone. Contains control points for access to the hot zone and the decontamination area. Decontamination is a process of removing or neutralizing and uh, properly disposing of hazardous materials. So this is where you're going to get decontaminated. So anybody who's pulled out of the hot zone is going to go to the warm zone and be decontaminated. And then they're going to go to the cold zone. Safe area where personnel do not need to wear any special protective clothing for safe operation. Includes personnel staging, the command post, EMS providers in the area for medical monitoring, support, and or treatment after decontamination. Role of the EMT. Your job is to report to a designated area outside of the hot and warm zones and provide triage, treatment, transport, and rehabilitation. Classifications of hazardous materials, NFPA 704, hazardous materials classification standard classifies hazardous materials according to health hazard and toxicity levels, fire hazard, chemical reactive hazard, and special hazards. Toxicity levels measures the health risk that a substance poses to someone who comes into contact with it. The higher the number, the greater mm -hmm. the toxicity. Okay, so remember this is, uh, instead of the placards, this is going to tell you uh, toxicity levels of hazardous materials, and that's going to tell you the health hazard and the protection needed. So four, like I said, is going to be extreme. Uh, minimal exposure causes death and special hazmat gear is needed. So personal protective equipment level, PPE levels indicate the amount and type of protective gear that you need to prevent injury from the substance. Level A is going to be most hazardous, requires fully encapsulated chemical resistant protective clothing that provides full body protection as well as CBA and special sealed equipment. I'm sure you guys have seen this in movies. They, um, they don that big white costume with the white hood on. Those are going to be your level A. Um, Equipment. Level B requires non-encapsulated protective clothing or clothing that is designed to protect against a particular hazard. Requires breathing devices that contain their own air supply, such as CBA and eye protection. Level C requires the use of non-permeable clothing and eye protection, face masks that filter all inhaled outside air. Level D requires a work uniform, such as coveralls, and that affords minimal protection. So level D is going to be your basic um, clothing. All levels require the use of gloves. Okay, so level A, remember, you guys seen this in movies. You're going to dress up so nothing gets in there. Level B, you have your, uh, your CBA. He's got a pack on. It's kind of hard to see it. He's got a CBA on. And then he's, so let's level C. He's got an uh, air filter inhaler. And then level D, um, personal protective equipment, just standard uh, uniform. Remember, look at all these guys, they're all wearing gloves. This guy's probably got about four, four gloves on. And he's probably got another three or so gloves on as well. Caring for patients is practical only to provide the simplest assessment of essential care in the hazard zone and the decontamination area because of the dangers, time constraints, bulky protective gear. 
Your care patients must address the following two issues. Any trauma that has resulted from other related mechanisms such as vehicle collision, fire, or explosion. The injury and harm that have resulted from exposure to toxic hazardous substance. Most serious injuries and deaths from hazardous materials result from airway and breathing problems. In some cases, a hazmat team may find patients who need immediate treatment before the decontamination area has been set up. You will need to increase the amount of protective clothing you wear, including CBA, two pairs of gloves, goggles or a face shield, a protective coat, respiratory protection, a disposable fluid and permeous uh, apron. So what is the purpose of the incident command system? There's a multitude of, of uh, purposes. So D, the purpose of the ICS is ensuring responder and public safety, achieving incident management goals and ensuring the efficient use of resources. So upon arriving at a scene in which the incident command system has been activated, you should expect to What is the purpose of the incident command system? Why is it structured in the way it's structured? So A, the incident commander establishes sectors of responsibility and sector officers. When functioning at an incident in which the incident command system has been activated, you should report to the appropriate sector office. Carry out your assignment and report back to the sector officer. In many cases, you'll be asked to report to a different sector. So when EMS responds to a disaster as part of their fair, their response within the ICS, EMS would start the, with a scene size up. What is the next step for the res first responding units? <laughs> so B, the first EMS unit to arrive needs to function within the ICS. Once you have performed a good scene size up and answer the three basic questions to complete a scene size up, command should be established by the most senior official. Notification to other responders should go out and necessary resources should be requested. Which of the following statements best describes a mass casualty incident? So D, a mass casualty situation is one of that, that places such a great demand on available equipment and personnel that the system is stretched to its limits or beyond. Why bus accidents and plane crashes are classic examples of MCIs, they are not the only situations that can exhaust your resources. Which of the following patients would have the highest treatment priority at the scene of a mass casualty incident? Uh, so which one of these patients would you tag red? Which patients do we work on on the scene of an MCI? And which patients do we leave behind? Do we start CPR on MCI if we find people who are pulseless and apneic? So A, three of the four patients, B, C, and D are dead. Tri triage efforts are aimed at providing the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. Attempting to resuscitate a patient in traumatic cardiac arrest is futile in almost all cases. How does a disaster differ from a mass casualty incident?
So D, many disasters such as droughts that cause widespread crop damage do not involve personal injury. MCI generally lasts no longer than a few hours, but emergency responders may be on the scene for days or weeks in a disaster. Although you could declare an MCI, only an elected official can declare a disaster. A large tanker truck is overturned on a highway. When you arrive, you see a clear li liquid leaking from the rear of the tanker. The driver appears to be unconscious, is still in the vehicle, and is bleeding heavily from the face. You should. So B, upon arriving at the scene of a possible hazmat incident, you must first step back and assess the situation. This can be very stressful, especially if you see a patient. However, rushing into such a situation puts your own life in jeopardy. Once you have properly assessed the scene, you should request appropriate assistance, such as a fire department or hazardous materials team. Which of the following situations most likely involves a hazardous material? So B, a crash that does not need to occur for a spill or leak to happen, a vehicle that is emitting an invisible cloud, should make you suspicious that a hazardous material is involved, especially if the vehicle is a tractor trailer rig. In such cases, in such cases, you should stay uphill and upwind and notify the fire department or hazmat team. When dealing with a hazardous materials incident, where should you set up your decontamination area? What are the three different areas? You have your hot, hot zone, warm zone, and your cold zone. What are the differences between the three? What does each one entail? So C, the decontamination area should be set up between the hazard zone and the treatment area. This way patients cannot bring any hazardous materials into the treatment area and contaminate anyone else. So they're going to go from the, ha the hazard zone to the decontamination area to the treatment area. Which toxicity level would you assign a hazardous material spill that could cause a person temporary damage or residual injury unless prompt medical treatment is given? What are the different types um, of levels and how severe is each one? So B, level two toxicity includes materials that could cause temporary damage or residual injury unless prompt medical treatment is provided. Level one toxicity includes materials that would cause little, if any, health hazard. Level three toxicity includes materials that are extremely hazardous to health and requires full protective gear. Level four toxicity includes materials that are so hazardous that even minimal contact will cause death. 